Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We pray that you are encouraged and uplifted by today's sermon. Well, good morning, Harvest. What a joy it has been to worship with you already today. Those songs, each one, uh, so meaningful to us in our walk with the Lord and so honoring to uh, Christ. It really is a great joy as a congregation to lift our voices together, isn't it? And uh, appreciate the worship team working so hard this week as they do every week to prepare uh, so well to lead us before the throne of grace. It's really been a joy. And uh, now we turn our attention to God's word together. And I invite you to turn with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. Today we are picking up our series in the book of 1 Peter. The series is called A Sojourner's Guide, A Sojourner's Guide, and today we consider 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12, and we consider the instruction here in this passage about the sojourner's life of love, the sojourner's life of love here in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12. And before we read this scripture together, why don't we bow in prayer and uh, look to the Lord for his blessing upon our time. Uh, Lord, we do thank you. You are worthy of our praise. Uh, You are our treasure. Uh, We live in your goodness. And Lord, we are so thankful that you are our vision. There are so many things that we could set our eyes upon these days that would discourage us, that would lead us astray, that would weaken us. And yet, Lord, through your word, through your spirit, you give us the opportunity for you to be our vision. And we need you to be our vision today. As we consider the life of love that you call us as sojourners in this world to lead, we need to look to you. You are our example and you are the source of love. And so we ask for your help as we consider your word today, that you would bring understanding and that you would bring conviction to hearts so that we would walk in light of this truth. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter 3, if you would look with me, beginning in verse 8. He writes, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Last month we spent a few weeks in Romans chapter 8 and we considered that glorious truth that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Because God is Trinity, God is love, he is the source of love, and we are his children. He is our Father. So it shouldn't surprise us at all when over and over again in God's word, he calls us to lead a life of love. After all, children are expected to resemble their parents, are they not? And if our Father is a God of love, then we should reflect that in a life of love. 
One of the joys, in fact, of watching children grow is to note the ways that they do, or maybe in some cases don't, resemble one or both of their parents. You can think about perhaps your own personality and characteristics and style and think about the ways that perhaps you drew that from one or both of your parents. Perhaps you have your mother's eyes or you have your father's hair or in my case, my father's lack of hair. Um, And that maybe that's the case for some of you as well. Maybe you have your mother's talent in the kitchen or your father's handyman skills or your mother's sarcastic wit or your father's quiet perseverance. The calling of the sojourner is to resemble our Heavenly Father and to do that by living a life of love. It's important for us to understand what the Bible says about love because there are many in the world around us that use the word love and use it in a very different way than Scripture uses it. It's also important for us to understand biblically what type of love we're talking about in this particular text. You may know that there are actually multiple Greek words for love. The one in our text today is the word for brotherly love. In fact, you know this Greek word already. It's the word philadelphos. Does that sound familiar? You may not be a fan of the Phillies or the 76ers or even of the Liberty Bell, but surely you can appreciate this great, rich word, Philadelphia, brotherly love. This is a family love. This is a love between siblings in the family of God. We have all experienced the love of the Heavenly Father, have we not? And we are called in turn to share that love with one another as brothers and sisters in the family. See, it's important for us to understand when we look at these verses, verses 8 through 12, this is addressed not to you, singular. Notice the beginning of verse 8. It says, finally, all of you. This is important because I can tell you, I am a very, very loving person when there's nobody else around. (laughs) Feel me on that? The problem is, true love is tested not in solitude, but in relationship. And we as a local church are called to be in family relationship with one another, and that's where the genuineness of our love is tested. You know the saying, you can pick your friends, but not your family. Now, I suppose you can pick your church family, but you can't pick every individual within that church family. You're called to come alongside, to worship with, to walk with, to witness with those who may see things a little bit different than you in some ways. Those who maybe have a personality that rubs you the wrong way. Those who have a bit of a different style or different convictions in certain areas. And yet we are called to love. So brotherly love is the type of love that verse 8 points to. And surrounding this mention of brotherly love are the companions of love, the attributes of love. And this is our first main point that we want to look at today in verses 8 and 9, the attributes of love. Point number one today. When genuine love is present, you can expect to find the attributes of a loving mind, a loving heart, and a loving response. Notice what verse 8 says about a loving mind. We actually see this through two short phrases in verse 8. The one toward the beginning of the verse, unity of mind, and then one at the very end of the verse, a humble mind. A loving mind unites with others and is humble. Unity of mind. Unity of mind is so important for us to pursue in relationship in the local church. Such an important thing for us to pursue, and yet it can seem daunting. Think about all the things that Christians can potentially disagree about, not have unity of mind over. Think about the area of music. I don't know that that's been a point of controversy in particular in our church, but I know in many churches it's a huge point of controversy. What to sing and how to sing it. People have different styles and different standards. Christians have different doctrines and different interpretations. Christians see differently when it comes to politics and culture. How in the world can we find unity of mind as brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, let me suggest to you 
that unity of mind is not found by agreeing to disagree. That's important because I think some groups of Christians do attempt to find unity by ignoring the disagreements. And I don't think that actually produces true unity of mind. Now, let me suggest to you that unity of mind is found by agreeing on the most important things. Who God is, we must have unity of mind on that. Who we are, we must have unity of mind on that. What our problem is and our need is, we must have agreement on that. What Christ has done for the solution of that need, to be our Savior, we must have agreement upon that. And when we can agree on those most important things, yes, there may be some minor differences in even doctrines and interpretations. There may certainly be differences in personality or style or convictions, but we can find enough unity to serve the Lord together if we agree on what is most important. Amen? I hope we can understand the difference between unison and harmony. These are musical terms. Unison is when a group of people is singing or playing the same song at the same time, all singing the exact same notes. Now, there is strength in unison, but there is a real beauty in harmony. When various musicians are playing or singing the same song at the same time, but with different complementary notes. If we are on the same page in what matters most, we can bear with one another and even complement each other well in those areas where we may not necessarily be in unison. We can still find unity and be harmonious in how we worship and serve the Lord. You know what I find? I find that churches can often find unity of mind, not only by digging into those most significant doctrines of Scripture, but just in serving the Lord together. What is our main calling from Jesus? It's to make disciples And as we share in that purpose from Jesus, when we are busy serving the Lord together, we have less time to squabble about petty disagreements. Amen? We agree about what is most important about the Lord and his word. We make disciples together and we do that in harmony with one another. It takes time to build this as a church family. It takes time. And it takes a lot of intentional interaction with one another. We're so thankful for all who are here or who are following us, who are singing the songs together and hearing the scripture together. But I hope every Sunday you don't go running out the front doors as soon as the last word is spoken. I hope you take time to mingle with others afterward, to find that fellowship and that harmony that we're called to. I hope you take advantage of some of these fellowship opportunities and events that are offered. In the announcement video, it was shared that the last Sunday of this month, there's a day in the park up at Proud Lake. That is something that all of you are invited to. And it will be a great day, not just to have some fun outside, but to be together and to work toward that unity of mind and spirit that we as brothers and sisters should be about. Unity of mind. Unity of mind is joined with that last phrase in verse 8, a humble mind. We can't achieve unity of mind unless we collectively have a humble mind. Humility. Some of these other virtues in this verse would have been celebrated in first century Greco-Roman culture into which Peter was writing but not humility. Humility was actually looked down and despised as a characteristic in that day. It was seen as a sign of weakness. So it was a very countercultural thing for Peter to say to his readers, have a humble mind, and it continues to be a countercultural thing in our day. Think of it. This very month, many in our culture are devoting this entire month to one word, pride. And yet we're called to humility as children of God. 
Paul wrote in Romans 12, 3, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. I believe biblically this is the essence of humility. That we don't consider ourselves, think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. I really need that scripture. In fact, if you could tattoo a scripture on the inside of your eyeballs so you could see it every moment of every day, that's probably the one that I need to be looking at constantly. Maybe I can write it on the inside of my glasses or something. I don't know. Um, I need to be reminded of this all the time because whether you're a recent believer in Jesus or whether you've been walking with him for decades, we ought not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Yes, we are redeemed saints and we should be encouraged by that. Yes, we are gifted to bless others and serve the king, but it is only because of the mercy and patience of God in our lives. If you are blessed with a mind that can grasp a high level of theology, praise God for that and never forget that you were a hell-bound sinner rescued by the mercy of Christ. If you're blessed with spiritual gifts that encourage those around you, praise God for that and never forget that you were a hell-bound sinner rescued by the mercy of Christ. If you're blessed with talents that amaze people and draw their compliments, praise God and never forget that you were a hell-bound sinner rescued by the mercy of Christ. Over and over in Scripture, we see the proverb, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you don't want God's grace, the most effective way to block God's grace from flowing into your life is to proudly pretend you don't need it. Right? If you want to invite God's grace into your life, the most effective way to do that is humbly admit that you do need it. So a loving mind is humble and it is unified with fellow believers and this corresponds with a loving heart. Not only a loving mind, but a loving heart is seen in this scripture. In those phrases, sympathy and a tender heart. On either side of that term brotherly love, we see sympathy and a tender heart. Sympathy. This is an important word for our church right now in this moment. We as a church are going through a season of unexpected change. And it is especially important for all of us right now as brothers and sisters to show sympathy and patience toward one another in this moment. A heart of sympathy remembers that we are all humans who all struggle with sin We all struggle with the temptations of this world. We all struggle with the opposition of Satan. We all deal with weaknesses, with disappointments, with pain, with loss. Sympathize with one another. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Have you ever experienced having a sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach when a good friend received bad news? Even if that bad news didn't directly affect you, you felt their pain. That's what it means to weep with those who weep. On the other hand, maybe you've experienced having an irrepressible smile brought to your face when a friend received good news. Even if that good news didn't affect you directly, You were drawn to rejoice with one who was rejoicing. That is the heart of sympathy. And again, we can only walk in sympathy toward one another as we are actually with each other and communing with one another and communicating with one another in significant ways. One of the great ways to do that in our context is to be part of a small group. We're really blessed to have 14 great small groups represented here at our church. 
These are groups that meet in various communities around western Wayne County. They meet at various days and times of the week, and you all are invited to be in one. That is a great context, not only for growth, but to be close to people in an immediate family, so to speak, to know and be known, to love and be loved, to rejoice with those who are going through good times and weep with those who are going through hard times and to receive practical support and encouragement in that. If you're not taking advantage of that opportunity, I would encourage you to take advantage of that this week. We've got a list of available small groups out in our lobby next to our information desk. You could take one of those brochures today and call a couple of those leaders and say, hey, can I come by and visit this week? I'm sure they'd be glad to have you. If you are already in a small group, let me have a word of exhortation toward you. Be open toward welcoming others in. Here's the catch-22. When you really like your small group, that's a good thing. But sometimes you can try to hold on and maintain those exact same friendships for years. And while the depth of friendship is good, the Lord is calling us to welcome new brothers and sisters into those contexts as well. We have many new faces, new souls here at our church that have come to us within this last year seeking truth, seeking genuine Christian community. Let's, in our groups, in our contexts, in our ministries, welcome new brothers and sisters. That's the heart of sympathy. Sympathy corresponds with this other term in the verse, a tender heart. A tender heart. This refers to the deepest level of human compassion toward other sinners and sufferers. This is the heart that Jesus showed in his ministry on earth when he was moved with compassion before healing the needy and teaching the lost. A tender heart contrasts with a hard heart. There's a big difference, right? A hard heart sees only the offenses committed against me. A tender heart remembers the offenses that I have committed against others. A hard heart sees only the weaknesses in others. A tender heart comes alongside those weaknesses with corresponding strengths. A hard heart is quick to condemn. A tender heart is eager to restore A hard heart says, come on, man, what's your problem? A tender heart says, how can I help? We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And while it is wrong to ignore sin that needs to be addressed, it is right to extend mercy and compassion toward other sinners. Where would you be? without the mercy and compassion of God in your life. And so as we, by God's grace, work toward a loving mind and a loving heart, we fulfill what Jesus said in John 13, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A loving heart, a loving mind, and a loving response toward those from the outside who may harass us because of our faith. Notice verse 9. This is one of those verses, I'm going to be honest, in my flesh, I don't like this verse. It says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. That's difficult to do. If someone's trying to harm you, harass you, speak evil words against you, what is your initial response? To defend yourself, to lash back. And this verse says, don't repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling. So you, okay, so you say, okay, well maybe with God's help I could grit my teeth and just kind of ignore it when someone harasses me or hurts me with their words. Maybe I can do that. But, but the verse goes on. Don't just grit your teeth and bear it, but on the contrary, bless. Oh man, not only do I need to avoid lashing back, I need to actually repay good and blessing for that evil. We cannot do this in our flesh. This runs completely contrary to the sinful nature. 
We need the help of the Lord in this. And he helps us by giving us in this verse a motivation. He says, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. If you would, would you hold your finger there in 1 Peter 3 and turn back to the Old Testament, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 25. The book of Proverbs, chapter 25, it's toward the center of your Bible. In fact, if you open your Bible to the center, you'll probably land in the book of Psalms. Proverbs is the very next book. Proverbs, chapter 25, and I'd like for us to see in this Old Testament scripture a very, very similar instruction that the Lord gives through the writer of Proverbs. Notice Proverbs 21, uh, 25. Read with me verse 21 and 22. The Lord tells us in this text, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. You're like, oh, I, I actually kind of like this verse. <laughs> I mean, a little bit difficult to give my enemy food if he's hungry or to give him something to drink if he's thirsty. But I would love to heap some burning coals on the head of my enemy. And I've got a biblical reason to do so. Well, not so fast. It's important for us to understand some cultural context here. See, in the ancient world, before there were things like lighters and matches, fire was still an important thing to have in the hearth of your home. And you maintained that fire by keeping burning coals going constantly. That at various times throughout the day, you could, you could turn into some flames to cook food for your family. Certainly, in the cold weather months, it would provide warmth for your household. And if that fire in the hearth ever completely died, you were in a pretty bad way. You would be forced to put a container on your head, as many cultures around the world will do, and walk to your neighbor's house and say, Hey, please, neighbor, I've run out of coals. Can I have a few? And what God is telling us here is that if your neighbor comes and needs some fire to cook food for his family and to warm his house, give him some coals and don't just give him a few. Heap coals of fire upon his head generously so that he will have no doubt that he will be able to cook food for his family and provide warmth for his household. We respond even to our enemies by having sympathy for the basic needs of their life. And in doing so, we reflect the goodness and kindness and mercy and patience of our Father who sends his nourishing rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. And in this text, we are told you do this you follow the Lord in this, and he will reward you. Just as we're told in 1 Peter 3, 9, repay blessing for evil and reviling, and you will obtain a blessing. So let's make this real. Who is that person in your life who gives you a hard time for no reason? Maybe it's someone who specifically gives you a hard time because of your faith in Christ. Could be an unsaved employer or coworker, could be an unsaved spouse or classmate or maybe just a really obnoxious Facebook friend. Who is that person? What act of blessing and kindness could you show toward that person this week? Maybe it's a kind word. Maybe it's a genuine offer of help. Maybe you leave a nice plate of cookies on their desk in their cubicle. And I'm talking about good cookies. Like, good cookies. None of that macadamia nut stuff. Good cookies. And, and I'm not talking about mixing some stuff into that, those cookies that's going to make them sick. No, like good and, and, and healthy cookies that won't make them sick. I'm not trying to give you any ideas here. No, no bless that person. 
Bless that person and the Lord will reward you. You say, Pastor Mike, I don't know if I can bring myself to do that yet. Okay, well, at the very least, let me encourage you, pray for that person. Pray, yes, that they would repent and receive the blessing of salvation and pray for yourself that you could love them even in their sin and enmity the way Christ loved us. Now, there's certainly a question that would come up in a text like this because it seems the main type of harassment in mind here in this verse is a verbal harassment, reviling. So you say, well, Mike, what about things that people may be doing to me that go way beyond that? Things that may even be violating or violent. Well, this is where we understand biblically that the Lord provides civil authorities to enact justice. And it is perfectly biblical and reasonable to go to those authorities to enact just justice for one who would harm you. Now, many in Peter's audience would not have had recourse to those means of justice. But by and large, we do. And we certainly can take advantage of those means of justice in our society. Those are good things given to us by the Lord. But even... As you take those steps of protection from one who would harm you, still pray that you can retain a heart of forgiveness, not of vengeance. Again, where would you be if Christ had repaid evil for your evil? Where would you be if he had repaid reviling for your reviling? You are saved because he repaid blessing for your evil. And the really neat thing is that God may use your response of repaying good for evil to bring someone to saving faith. Think about it. When Jesus hung on that cross, what was his prayer? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. There was a young man named Stephen who was greatly impacted by Christ's example, who a short time later was being stoned to death for his bold witness. And his final prayer just before he died was, Lord, do not lay this against their charge. There was a young man observing that blessing in response to evil that Stephen offered, that young man's name was Saul. His name would later be Paul, the apostle. And he found himself in a jail for no good reason. He was being treated unjustly, harassed, and persecuted. The Lord sent an earthquake so he and Silas could escape. And the jailer was about to put himself to death because he knew he was going to die anyway if his prisoners escaped. And Paul and Silas and the others said, don't do that. We are all here. We're not going to exchange evil for evil, but we are going to bless. And he preached the gospel to this jailer's family and they were saved. And so it continues throughout the century. The way of Christ is not evil for evil, but blessing for evil. If you are being harassed, if you are being opposed by someone who hates the Lord and hates your faith, don't see it as an obstacle. See it as an opportunity to follow in the steps of Jesus. Because the calling of the sojourner is to live a life of love. And we've seen the attributes of love, a loving mind, a loving heart, a loving response. And now we want to consider the actions of love in verses 10 through 12. Point number two this morning, the actions of love. Is that point number two? Point number four, we'll go with that. (laughs) Now these three verses, verses 10 through 12, are actually an extended quote from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. Psalm 34 was one of the Apostle Peter's favorite psalms. This was a psalm that was written by David before he was made king. If you understand the story of David, you know that he was anointed to be king, but then spent some years on the run from jealous King Saul. You remember that point in his life? That was the point in his life when he wrote Psalm 34. 
He was in exile. He was facing persecution for doing good. He was in a very similar situation to Peter's readers. In fact, at one point in Psalm 34, he refers to himself as a sojourner. And so his exhortations in Psalm 34 were very appropriate for Peter to bring to his audience and to us and to show us what love in action looks like. As we walk in the attributes of love, we bear the fruits of love and we perform the actions of love. The first one that we see in verse 10 is that love speaks truthfully. Love speaks truthfully. Notice verse 10 says, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. As children of the God of truth, We should be a people of truth. In our marriages, in our families, in the workplace, and in context of our local church. And yes, even to a watching world around us that in many ways does not value the truth. Keeping away from speaking deceit is yet another counterintuitive instruction in this passage because there is great pressure in our day to tell people what they want to hear whether or not it is true. It is commonly portrayed in our culture as a loving thing to affirm someone in their chosen falsehood. I've spoken with many of you in recent months about the topic of pronouns. And people pick pronouns that may or may not match with how God made them and the gender role that God assigned them at birth. And even if you're very kind about this and not obnoxious about this, if you use God-given pronouns rather than preferred pronouns, you will be painted as unloving. Speaking the truth kindly Humbly, but speaking the truth is the only way to show genuine love to your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you will not affirm them in a false fantasy. If you want to see good days, as this verse says, be part of building a society that lives not by lies. But this isn't just to be pointed toward the other Out there, we speak truth to those who are close to us as well. That friend with a blind spot who needs loving correction. Don't lead them in a way of deceit. Lead them in a way of truth. Love speaks truth and verse 11 says that love pursues peace. Notice verse 11 says, Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Really important for us to be doing both of those things in the first half of verse 11. Turn away from evil and do good. There's a lot of evil to avoid, but if the only thing you're doing day after day, week after week, is avoiding the evil, you're going to be jumping around like a chicken with his head cut off. No, we avoid evil, but we do that as we are pursuing the straight path of peace. When I think about this verse, I'm reminded of an activity that is, for me, almost weekly in the warm months, and that is mowing my lawn. How many of you mow your lawn on a regular basis? Let me see your hands. Okay, all right, there's my fellow lawn mowers. I like that. All right, we have kind of a, a camaraderie, a community here, because there are certain things about mowing a lawn. And one of those things is you want straight lines. I mean, if you want satisfaction in your work as a mower of the lawn, those lines need to be straight. Whether they're this way or that way or diagonal, they need to be straight. There's one particular portion of my lawn in the front yard. We have a big, beautiful magnolia tree out front. And those branches spread wide and they hang low. And as I am mowing under the magnolia tree, I want to keep that straight line, but I need to be careful because there are some moments that if I don't turn to one side or the other, I'm going to get a branch in the eye. And yet, even as I am turning away from that thing that would harm me, I want to maintain that straight path. 
And that's the idea of this verse, that we swerve away from the evil as we are doing good, seeking peace and pursuing God's straight and narrow road. We pursue peace as we speak truth. Again, these things aren't contradictory. Yes, there is a version of peace that smooths over problems and tells people whatever it is they want to hear, but that's not God's way of peace. Peace does speak the truth to one another, and yet, on the other hand, there are those who, in their zeal for truth, can actually stir up conflict where there doesn't have to be. 1 Timothy 2.2 says that a Christian should desire a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And yes, we can pray for that and work toward that even as we are in exile. In a culture that in many ways dishonors God, we still desire to be at peace so long as the truth is not violated. But I don't think living in peace means that we are passive I don't think living at peace means that we fail to be salt and light and influence the world around us. Peace is not achieved by passively allowing wicked people to run everything. No, if we have an opportunity to advocate God's standard of good in society, we ought to do so. And this is why the passage that we will consider next week calls us to speak up and to speak out. We speak the truth while pursuing a path of peace And then finally, in verse 12, we see the action that love walks with God. Love walks with God. Notice verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. There's a very personal component to this verse. Notice those words, the eyes of the Lord, his ears, the face of the Lord of the Lord. If we've learned anything over this last year, I hope we've learned what a blessing it is to commune with someone face to face. It's a great blessing to have that face to face interaction with people and how much more is it a blessing to have the eyes of the Lord upon us, to have his ears open to our prayer, for his face to be toward us. And yet there is a question that may come up in this verse as you see that the ears of the Lord are open to the prayer of the righteous but not those who do evil. We may come away from this verse thinking, well, maybe with our righteous deeds we need to earn God's hearing of our prayers. Does this verse mean that if I'm struggling in a sin in a given moment that God will not hear my prayer? Well, in a certain sense, God always hears your prayers. He's omniscient. He knows everything you think. There's no question of him being aware of your prayers. But here's the point of this verse. Don't expect God to give you what you ask for if you are working against his purposes. Don't expect God to give you what you ask for if you are working against his purposes. If I come home from work one day and I turn into my driveway and I notice a guy in a ski mask on my front porch, trying to break into a window. I'm going to go over and confront him. Now, let's imagine that this guy in the ski mask is especially bold. And I say, what are you doing, man? And he says, hey, what's up? I'm breaking into your house. I'm going to see if there's anything valuable that I can take and sell on the black market. And I'm like, bro, I don't want you to do that. And he's like, sorry, I'm going to. But it's actually really difficult to get through this window. I mean, I could like break it, but then I I might cut myself as I'm climbing through and I could try to pry it open, but it's not really easy. These windows are nice and tight. So could you just let me borrow your house key real quick? And I'm just going to go in through the front door nice and easy, take whatever I want to take, and then I'll be out of your hair. Am I going to give that guy my key? Of course not. I'm not going to respond to someone's request if they are working against my purposes. And God will not respond to your request if you are working against his purposes. On the other hand, if you are walking in love, walking in truth, pursuing peace, you can have confidence that God's ear is open to your righteously motivated prayer. If you are not walking in truth and peace, go to the Lord in prayer, but go to him in repentance. 
not presumption. So the calling of the sojourner is to live a life of love, and when we do, we resemble our heavenly Father. Perhaps you're here today and you say, well, this, this message on the whole is actually a little bit discouraging to me because I don't feel that I'm resembling the Father's love very well. So what can I do, Pastor Mike, in order to be more loving? Well, here's the simple answer. If you want to be more like your father, spend time with him. Why is it that you've taken on so many of one or both of your parents' attributes? It's not so much because of your genes in most cases, it's because of the proximity that you had to them. And if you are proximate to your heavenly Father, you will grow in love. Behold his glory that we see in the face of Jesus Christ. Talk to him in prayer. Read this this treasure of a book that he has given to us. See him acting in love. And we, by proximity, will be drawn to act in love as well. Don't shrink back from your father because you're not a loving person. Draw near to him so that he may make you a loving person.